You know, back in 1987, I was a baseball card collecting, Nintendo Entertainment System playing, BMX riding kid just about to hit puberty. And I'd spend evening hours watching TV like a lot of kids, and Charles in Charge, Silver Spoons, Growing Pains, things like that. And the commercials, they just hit different when you're a kid, you know? You've never seen a place like show this pizza place. It's new at -Hat, the all-terrain armored transport from... To that aroma come through when the folder starts to brew the best one night I saw a commercial for a moon-headed McMascot, and I was McMesmerized. I mean, this was like right up my alley. I loved Weird Al, still do, and this was a parody of Mac the Knife being sang by a McNugget salesman. The clock strikes half past six, babe. Time to head for golden light. Now imagine my disgust 30 years later when I see it being used as a symbol for like open fascism and white supremacy and stuff like that and it's all done in some cutesy little meme format. On message boards like 4chan and 8chan and what they started to do was take the text to speech program, I think it was AT&T's version, and they would write Moon Man racist raps. Now I'm going to play you one right now of Moon Man singing the Knuckles song so you get an impression of what this sounds like and what it looks like. Here I come, rougher than the rest of them, the best of them, tougher than leather. Now this is just a symbol of cheeseburgers and diabetes, but it got hijacked by the worst type of ideologue this planet knows, racial supremacists. And I'd like to say, you know, this is a one-off, but as anybody who remembers Pepe the Frog knows, this is a, something that happens all the time. You really can't have anything without these pieces of crap grabbing onto it. Now why is a channel that talks about lost civilizations and pyramids talking to you about McNugget commercials? because it ties directly to what we're going to discuss here. There's a concept called hyperdiffusionism, and that's basically the idea that one culture spread the advanced knowledge throughout all of the world, and its fingerprints can be found throughout all the other cultures on the planet, that this was the one that started civilization, basically. Now, this is frequently attributed to racist ideologies, and it's frequently something that you will see Atlantis hunters being accused of inadvertently promoting racism or deliberately promoting racism because of maintaining these kinds of ideologies. So we're going to examine these claims to the very core, see where this stuff started, and if it really started in racism, did it really start in white supremacy? Hi, I'm Dan. Welcome to the Dunking, and holy crap, this is probably going to get my channel shut down. I hope not. Please, YouTube gods, be kind. Of course you know the story of Noah's Ark where the guy builds a boat, puts a couple of each animal on there, his family, rides out the flood, and then restarts humanity and eventually you get us. But did you know that there's part of the story that really doesn't ever get repeated very much? And here, let me tell you the, the next little bit about drunken Noah. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took the garment and laid it across their shoulders, then they walked in backwards and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so they would not see their father naked. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves, will he be to his brothers. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. So when you get to the Middle Ages, well, guess who the Europeans decided were the sons of Japheth, then the sons of Ham, and the sons of Shem? Just give you three guesses. Here's an old TO map from back in those days, right? And you can see very clearly that on that map, the Japheth peoples, they're in Europe. And in Asia, which uh, basically back then was the Middle East for the most part, um, those were your Semite people, right? And the sons of Ham, well, they were in Africa. And this was used to justify a lot of really horrific crap because, I mean, well, Noah, he's one of God's greatest prophets, right? And well, he said that these guys were supposed to be our slaves and we're supposed to live in their tents. So to hell with all of these people on a certain degrees of to hell. To hell with you more than to hell with them. I mean, I guess somebody should have told those people that they shouldn't have, like, to have laughed at their dad or something. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? But this is what we had. Now, in the early days of the sciences, when they were expected to bear out the Bible, this became part of the standard ethnography of the time. And eventually they discovered, like, Indo-European was a thing, that there was a connection between India and the European continent, and then it went from the people of Japheth to the Aryans, and it was kind of a more scientific term, but it was still the same idea. Three races of people, and the 
white people at the top of the pecking order because thanks Noah you were nicer to us than you were to the other ones you, you whatever but this informed like all kinds of sciences back then it informed like linguistic studies and like studies of a culture and it informed colonization which was obviously the worst part of the entire thing now under this ideology Europeans were ordained by God to do this stuff so it was okay and it endorsed a lack of empathy. So this is something that is really ugly and definitely needs to be thought about when you're discussing this kind of stuff. There is a historic racism that stems from the Bible, that stems from very far back, that is that was used to inform all the way up into the early days of science. Now when Napoleon conquered Egypt in the 18th century, this view aged like a 90s rap song. The amazing architecture and culture on display showed that this idea of the Africans being cursed is R-O-N-G wrong. And it started people reevaluating that whole idea. Now that ethnography still took about a century to kick out of place. Um, a lot of that came about because of like origin of species and stuff helping erode the biblical grasp on science. But along the way, we get some really interesting characters like Ignatius Donnelly. Here's a nice piece of shit. While that curse of ham mentality is still very much alive and kicking, the now infamous Ignatius Donnelly comes onto the scene with his 1882 book, Atlantis, The Antediluvian World. He follows it up in 1883 with Ragnarok, Age of Ice and Gravel, and both of these are Atlantis hunting books, okay? Um, they did pretty well, the first one especially, and, and he ended up doing some speaking tours and whatnot. And they are influential. Um, Hancock's seminal work, Fingerprints of the Gods, does cite Donnelly's book a few times, more than a few. And to be frank, Donnelly's book is racist as fuck, man. It's horrible. It's, he says things like the Aryans were the only race that could innovate. One of his lines of evidence is that, like, well, you know, these myths didn't evolve, so they must have been, like, not in the hands of white folk because other cultures don't innovate. He believed that Atlantis was an Aryan homeland and like the, the utopia and that everybody spread out from there around the rest of the world is gross. It's just it's just a gross messed up book and it's no question as to why so many people complain about it in the modern day. And because it was so popular and still gets cited today, this has led many to make the claim that Donnelly is the father of hyperdiffusionism and that all of this crap comes from him and ergo it is at its core a racist ideology. Then guys like Hancock are held accountable for citing him and even if the parts he cites aren't racist, they say, oh, that's spreading white supremacist rhetoric. But when he does talk about the white civilizer gods in South America that Cortez supposedly was able to piggyback the old Quetzalcoatl Viracocha thing, that is something that has been recently debunked and, and people point out that, hey man, you know, the, the Spanish probably changed those myths. But that wasn't something that was taught until recently, until very recently. So when Hancock wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, unless he was really into those kinds of studies in a high level of academia, there's no way for him to have stumbled across it, all right? It's not like he could just go Google it and get on Google Scholar, freaking 90s, man, early 90s. So I always find that one kind of funny because even the letter from the Society of American Archaeologists that bashed Hancock to Netflix, it tacitly admits that this is something that has changed. But because he cited Donnelly to get there, they can pin that little racist thing on there. So I have to point out that had Donnelly not been a racist, that still would have been in his book, and it still would have been in Hancock's book. It was part of the legend of South America and Cortez until very recently, and a lot of people still think that's what happened because they haven't been taught otherwise. Now, as for Donnelly, attributing the origins of modern-day Atlantis hunting and the creation of hyperdiffusionism to him is absolutely critical to the people that want to deplatform people like Hancock. It's absolutely critical because nobody cares if Hancock lies about pyramids or if his information about Ganong Padang is wrong. Nobody cares. Well, archaeologists and historians, but not enough to get anything done. But if Hancock's promoting racism, well, now you've got a lever that you can push in society. So if you say Hancock is taking old school white supremacist rhetoric and he's repackaging it and selling it to the modern day, well, now, now you've got at least some angle that you can work that the average Joe will stop and listen to. Hopefully, that seems to be the idea. But wouldn't it be funny if Donnelly wasn't the father of hyperdiffusionism? Wouldn't it be hilarious if the guy that did create hyperdiffusionism didn't believe that Aryans were a superior race? And wouldn't it be a damn knee slapper if academics were aware of this, but they ignored it so they could continue to claim that Atlantis honey was rooted in racism?
Charles Etienne Brazier de Bourgborg was a French Catholic priest that went to Mexico and was supposed to save a bunch of souls, but when he was there, he kind of changed gears and became very obsessed with their culture and linguistic studies and became an expert. Like, he's the guy that translated the Popol Vol into French, and so it ended up into uh, the uh, Western lexicon of stuff. His work with the Mayan and Aztec people got him enough fame that he was placed as the archaeologist in charge of an expedition in 1864, and two years later, the data that he gathered there was used to write a book, Monuments of Ancient Mexico. Now, this is the book that first started the connection between South America and Egypt in pop culture. This was the book that first began that. So that's important thing one to keep in mind here. He attempted to crack undecipherable scripts and wrote a lot of different bridges for languages. Many of it failed, but a lot of his work is still considered foundational today. He was no crackpot. But he was the first to claim that there was a connection between South America, Central America, and Egypt. He was the first to claim that there was some parent culture that spread all these different little ideas about advanced civilizing notions around the world. He was the first to say that that was probably Atlantis. He was the first to say that a comet was what wiped them out. I mean, this, this guy... I call me crazy, but he might be the one that earned the title of the father of modern day Atlantis, honey. But but we're not done yet because he didn't think that the Aryans were the supermen of the world. He didn't think that they were the foundational race. As a matter of fact, he laughed at the idea. So here it is, well noted by a scholar whose opinion is often of great weight in questions of origins. He himself agrees with many others. The existence in Europe of pre-existing languages and peoples laughing at the Aryans. He believed the Native Americans were the most civilized. He believed that they were the ones that were connected to Atlantis the most by culture, blood, and even language. He believed that these were the ones that were tasked with civilizing the world after the fact, after the flood. He believed the entire world was in contact before the flood, and that's where you get like ideas of white people in South and Central America. They were just Phoenicians or whoever the hell, just doing some regular old trade. He had a very normal belief about race that you would expect from somebody who thought that the races split off after Noah, right? Before Noah, there wouldn't be separate races if that was the case, right? That was his view. It will be of the same fundamental proposition of my four letters where I advance and where I prove that civilization all whole to which the Orient has always been given cradle comes from the West, that is to say, from America. So if Brazier Boy thought any of these races were superior, it certainly wasn't the Aryans. But if you need more evidence, you should read the subtitle of his book if you've got a day and a half. Mexico, Absolute Exposure of the Mexican Hieroglyphic System, The End of the Stone Age, Temporary Ice Age, Beginning of the Bronze Age, Origins of Civilization and Religions of Antiquity. Now, despite appearances to the contrary, this isn't evidence of ancient chat GPT, but it is evidence of his belief in Mexico being the seat of civilization. His earlier book, Monuments of Ancient Mexico, and that book, The Four Letters, that I just read the monster subtitle from, these books were considered extremely influential in the early days of Atlantis, honey, but they're not cited very much today. They're both in French, so that's a big deal. Um, Jason Colavito, actually, is a well-known debunker, and he... Um, published a translation of the paper where a uh, dude, a uh, Brazier boy here talks about the comet impact wiping things out. So these guys do know he exists, but they don't ever talk about him being like the father of Atlantis hunting or any of that stuff. So I, I want to just like hammer this home because you've heard probably a thousand times at this point, Ignatius Donnelly is the father of hyperdiffusionism and modern day Atlantis hunting. So let me hammer this home again. Modern day Atlantis hunting was not created by Ignatius Donnelly. Hyperdiffusionism was not created by Ignatius Donnelly. These things were created by Charles Etienne Brazier de Borgborg, and this man was not a white supremacist. He believed that the Mayans were the race that were tasked with re-civilizing the world after the end of the Great Flood, not the Aryans. This was not an excuse for colonialism when it first became a thing. It was hijacked by those dirty sons of bitches later down the road. So when you hear somebody say, oh, you know, well, this is just uh, racist rhetoric being repackaged, you can tell them they're not doing very good research. Because this isn't the only guy that was before Donnelly either. There was one other dude too. And guess what? He also thought the Mayans were the ones that civilized the world, not the Aryans. <gasps>
An American photographer and archaeologist, Le Pignon was next on the scene with hyperdiffusionism. He did a lot of field work in Mexico back in those days. Matter of fact, him and his wife, Alice Dixon, also a photographer, were the first on the scene at Chichen Itza, and they did a lot of work there. His work was considered pretty influential back in the day, but it largely fell out of favor, they pretty much never cited anymore. Like Brazier Le Frenchy de Froggy, he's of the opinion that the Mayans were the most powerful, influential, and technologically superior people in the post-flood world. He actually believed that they conquered India, and that was how the two cultures had so much in common. That was his belief. So he certainly didn't believe that you know the Mayans were some inferior race. He thought that they were the most superior race in all of human history. Basically, the stuff that he saw in South America impressed him and his wife so much he was going to die on that hill, and literally, when he died, he was still on that hill. He's the guy that discovered that Chakmul statue, that heart-wielding thing of nightmares, and the similarities to Egyptian art with that was what sold him, and he, he was never, seems to have never, like, looked back after finding that thing. As far as he was concerned, Egypt and Mayan culture were related, period, end of story. And... Like I said, he was pretty influential up until this stuff, like it started slowly, people would chip away at it, he would continue to fight and dig his heels in, and by the time he died, well, if you look at the works that were published afterwards in regards to it, he was heavily attacked just like immediately before his corpse was even cold, people were like picking apart his work. However, he is the second person to posit hyperdiffusionism, doing so a good 20 years before Donnelly, and is one of the people that Donnelly cites in his works. He was not a white supremacist. So this is two people that created hyperdiffusionism in modern-day Atlantis hunting before Ignatius Donnelly that were not white supremacists, that actually believed that Native Americans were the superior race at the end of the flood, if you want to get all racist about it. But it's pretty obvious that race itself didn't inform his position. It was based on evidence. And you might disagree with this evidence. Many did. But this is an important thing to keep in mind because this is a pattern we can trace to the modern day. Because when Ben takes his vases, for example, and he's all like, man, these show evidence of ancient high technology. You might think that that's the stupidest thing you ever heard in your life. And that's fine. But it's not racist. He's not saying, man, if these were only found in Greece, I would accept that they had computers 6,000 years ago. I would accept that they had milling machines and lathes and CNC machines 6,000 years ago. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying because it's in Africa it's a problem. He's saying, who the hell is supposed to have lathes and milling machines 6,000 years ago? Or take Jimmy Corsetti when he talks about how did they move all these big rocks in Egypt. You might think that that's a dumb thing. You might think it's obvious how they moved all those big rocks. But he's not saying how do they move all those big rocks because they're in Africa. Where does he think Atlantis was, man? He thinks it was in Africa. This has nothing to do with race. It is about something that they observe and they're trying to find an explanation for. You might disagree with the evidence that they use and that's fine. But bringing up racism, that's crap, unless their point is actually racist. But, you know, if you're going to just say, well, Ignatius Donnelly, he's the father of all this stuff, and he was racist, well, you can't really say that if you've watched this video, now can you? And what's really weird about this, and you have to wonder, is if my hairy ass could find this with a little bit of research online, why aren't all these academics with access to all these expensive journals and whatnot, why aren't they able to figure this out? When the Society for American Archaeologists wrote a letter to Netflix trying to get them to do something about Hancock's ancient apocalypse, they had a few things they complained about, but their heavy hitter, their real silver bullet, was the accusations of racism. If I may read from their paper, The assertions Hancock makes have a history of promoting dangerous racist thinking. His claim for an advanced global civilization that existed during the Ice Age and was destroyed by comets is not new. This theory has been presented, debated, and refuted for at least 140 years. It dates to the publication of Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, 1882, and Ragnarok, The Age of Ice and Gravel, 1883, by Minnesota Congressman Ignatius Donnelly. This theory steals credit for indigenous accomplishments from indigenous people and reinforces white supremacy. Now note the falsehood. This theory dates to Ignatius Donnelly when both Brazier Boy and Plunger Boy wrote about this 20 plus years prior and both of them were not trying to steal from indigenous Americans. They were actually giving them more credit than credit should be due, right? The Mayans civilized the entire planet. Certainly not the kind of thing that you could call white supremacists. But 
why didn't they mention it? Did they not find it? I find that hard to believe because if you just go to Atlantis, the antediluvian world's freaking Wikipedia page, it lists these two men as sources for Ignatius Donnelly, as influences for Ignatius Donnelly. If you go look at the works that they've done, if you go read about them, one of the things is they did good work, but unfortunately they influenced Ignatius Donnelly. It's known that these guys were his influences. So why don't they ever mention it? The answer is in the argument employed by the Society of American Archaeologists letter. You can't claim Hancock's influences are all rooted in racism if the origins of his influences aren't rooted in racism. So they skip La Bra Boy and they skip La Plunger Boy and they go straight to Donnelly and pretend that these other influences never existed so that they can make those sort of claims. This began with Ignatius Donnelly. It's kind of messed up. This brings me back to the Mac Tonight ad. If somebody said that the Moon Man is inherently a racist symbol, they'd be full of shit. But on top of that, they would be seeding the Moon Man to the racists, giving them a freaking win, telling them, hey man, all you gotta do is take one of our things and make it racist and now it's yours and we'll just avoid it because it's racist now. You want something, just touch it. You keen Midas all of our shit away. Is that the, the message we wanna send? I, I personally, I don't think so. But I'm not an expert when it comes to like hate symbols and whatnot. I, and I frequently defer to experts for those of you who watch this channel for a while. So in this case, there are experts on hate symbols and on this kind of thing. So I wonder what they say we should do in a situation where this thing originally wasn't racist, but some racists have hijacked it. And now sometimes when it shows up, it has racist connotations. What does the ADL say to do? McDonald's restaurant chain mascot, Mac Tonight, which featured a smiling crescent moon image wearing sunglasses. In the 2000s, internet users began to create GIFs and videos of Mac Tonight, which they called Moon Man, typically coupled with violent or racist rap songs using computer-generated voices. By 2015, the Moon Man meme spread to other forums such as 4chan and 8chan, where it became associated with alt-right language and imagery, including explicit white supremacist imagery. For a time, hundreds of offensive Moon Man songs existed online. Since then, it has joined Pepe the Frog and assorted other images in the pantheon of favored alt-right graphics. However, because of the Moon Man's mundane and non-racist origins, as well as the fact that Mac Tonight imagery is still also used by people who are not white supremacists, care must be taken to judge a Moon Man image only in context before determining its association with white supremacy. A version of the meme that contains no racist or white supremacist elements should not be automatically construed to have such a meaning. I hope now that I've shed some light on this and I see less academics and debunker types, you know, being just broad brush, this is racist, and we see some more, you know, people following what the ADL said. Pay attention to the fact that this wasn't rooted in racism, that its origins aren't racist. Some racist hijacked it, so you might have to look out for racism when you're evaluating these claims. But there's no reason to assume that it's racist just because it's Atlantis hunting or includes hyperdiffusionism. Guilt by associations out, guys. Get a new argument. Well, thanks so much for watching. You know, I do have a Patreon, and I don't know if this video is going to be monetized or not. And I did put a lot of effort into it. So if you're the kind of person who likes to donate to people, I would really appreciate it. I do provide exclusive content on the Patreon, so I'm not just asking for free money. You will get to at least watch some stuff that you're not going to get to watch anywhere else unless somebody's pirating my stuff. Oh, God. Thanks so much for watching. You guys have a great day. We'll see you next time.